Welcome to Knaresborough and a glimpse of its greatest asset, the world famous panoramic view of the fairy tale gorge of the River Nid, some 120 feet below us, and beyond it, a hint of the royal hunting ground of the forests of Knaresborough, which used to extend 20 miles to the west and covered 100,000 acres. Now, about 400 years BC, the Celts came, the ancient Britons, and they gave a name to the river, the Nid. And then about 400 years or so AD, the Angles came and gave a name to the settlement high above the river here, Knaresborough, which in their speech was originally something like Knarresburg, the fortress on the rock. And then the Normans came and they built the first stone castle here and a later Norman king, King John, in the beginning of the 13th century uh, built a very fine castle and caused a great dry moat to be dug out over there extending the defences all the way around. And also hunted in the forest of Knaresborough and did administrative work here and especially, this is something we're very proud of in Knaresborough, he performed the first known almsgiving known as the Royal Maundy and Maundy Thursday 1210 when he fed and clothed 13 Knaresborough paupers and on the Friday uh, fed a hundred more and a thousand throughout Yorkshire and it really was a remarkable occasion. Now, about a hundred years after King John's time, Edward II completely rebuilt the castle and turned it into a palatial residence with 12 towers and a great keep, a remnant of which we see here. No, it seems to me staying there like some uh, stump of an old tooth. Very substantial it was because the rest of the castle, as we later hear, was completely destroyed. Underneath it, though, is the best preserved part of the castle, which is the dungeon, with walls 15 feet thick, from which dungeon no one ever is said to have escaped. Now this was the entrance to Edward II's castle, the Barbican Gate, and it became the subject of the seal of the Honour of Knaresborough, which I have on my Knaresborough official tie here. Originally it had a drawbridge and a portcullis, you know, the sort of trellis gate, which we see in this picture. And if you look here, you can see the groove up and down which the portcullis was raised and lowered. Over here, we have a rather interesting feature installed in 2006. This is the Knaresborough Community Mosaic, designed by Julie Cope, and this represents, really summarises, the history of the castle. Now this panel shows Queen Philippa, who married Edward III in 1328 in York, and they came here when she was a bride of 15 years of age and she was often resident in the castle, she did a great deal for the town. She restored the parish church, for example, in 1343, that's why that is shown. But the interesting thing is that her son, John of Gaunt, became Lord of Knaresborough in 1372. Now he was Duke of Lancaster, and that means that the castle, even today, is part of the Duchy of Lancaster and belongs to the Queen. Continuing to move around clockwise, we come to the siege of Knaresborough Castle. This took place towards the end of 1644, following the Battle of Marston Moor. And uh, the castle, of course, was loyal to King Charles, but the parliamentarians uh, brought a great cannonade against it, and on the 20th of December, 1644, it was taken. Now, when people see the ruins of the castle today, they assume this was caused by the battle, but not so. This took place four years later, following an act of parliament which said that all castles loyal to King Charles 
were to be slighted, that is, to be systematically demolished by gunpowder and crowbar and so on. While the demolition of the castle was in progress, Oliver Cromwell called in at Knaresborough, I think, to see how it was getting on. And I like to think that as he wandered around this site and saw the castle being destroyed and then looked out over the river, it occurred to him that though he had destroyed the castle, he had not been able to destroy our famous view. Now we've come up here to see what I regard as the jewel in the crown of Knaresborough, the parish church of St John the Baptist, our oldest, our most complete building, delightful place. The first documented reference is in 1100 and you can see the successive layers of the history of the church and right at the top we have this little candle snuffer spire added in about 1520. Above the clock are some words from St Paul, redeeming the time, which in modern English means make the very most of the time you have left. So let's get on and have a look inside. We're now entering the church by the south porch, noting the 18th century fanlight grill above us, and also on this bench here, a mouse by Thompson of Kilburn. The church was burnt and badly damaged by the marauding Scots flushed with the victory of Bannockburn, but eventually it was restored by Queen Philippa and reconsecrated in 1343. And some of the best examples of her restoration are seen in St Edmund's Chapel here, the decorated style of architecture it's known as, and here it is over the piscina where the priest washed his hands and washed the vessels for Holy Communion. The sedilia, Latin for seat, where the clergy sat during those long services. And best of all, the Easter sepulchre where the elements for the Eucharist, the bread and wine, were placed on Good Friday and a vigil was kept over them, and then at dawn on Easter Sunday, they were taken from here and carried in procession to the high altar to celebrate the resurrection on Easter morning. We've now moved to the north side of the church, to the chapel of the ancient Slingsby family. Here is Francis Slingsby, who died in 1600, age 78, on his right, unusually, because she was of a higher social status, his wife Mary, who was the daughter of Sir Thomas Percy. Now just think, this man was a cavalry officer under Henry VIII, Mary Tudor and Queen Elizabeth. A remarkable family. Their eldest son is Sir Henry Slingsby, MP for Knaresborough, High Sheriff of Yorkshire, but that didn't prevent him from spending two years in prison for mishandling the funds of the Duchy of Lancaster. And here we see him in his shroud, rising from the dead on the Day of Judgment. This handsome effigy is over the tomb of Sir Henry's brother, Sir William Slingsby, also MP for Knaresborough, and Commissary of the Fleet under Queen Elizabeth and knighted by James I in 1603. In contrast to the more elaborate tombs, we have this plain slab of black marble, brought here from St Robert's Priory to honour Sir Harry Slingsby. Sir Harry was a royalist who had fought on the losing side at Marston Moor, 
And it says here at the bottom that he was executed by the tyrant Cromwell. He had been arraigned on a charge of high treason, but Cromwell, impressed by Sir Harry as a gentleman, commuted the sentence, which would have, of course, been hanging, drawing and quartering for a traitor, to the comparatively respectable one of beheading. He was beheaded on Tower Hill, and the headless body was brought back here to Knaresborough. And when this tomb was opened a few years ago, it was found that the skeleton was indeed without a head. The saddest tomb of all is the tomb of Sir Charles Slingsby, who on the 4th of February 1869 was hunting with the York and Ainsty hounds, a fox hunt near Newby Hall. And they were crossing the River Ure in a barge that big enough to hold both horses and men. But the horses became restless, the barge capsized, and on that day, eight horses and six men were drowned including Sir Charles Slingsby, the last of the line. Before we leave the church, we notice the old school once connected with it, King James's Grammar School, founded by the Reverend Dr. Robert Challoner in 1616 with a charter granted by James I. Some years ago, on a highway program, I was able to show to Sir Harry Seacombe and indeed the whole nation the great scroll of our original 1616 school rules, including fascinating items like uh, boys will bring candles for the winter, bows and arrows for the games period, and all conversation after the first year must be entirely in Latin. Well, times have changed. In 1901, King James's Grammar School moved up to the site just off York Road, and in 1971 it became a fine, modern, comprehensive school, King James's School. And yet the link with King James is still preserved in the uniform, and the girls wear these uh, lovely Stuart tartans. This is the dress uh, Stuart tartan of King James, and as they disport these in the town, I think they're rubbing in, ironically, uh, the fact of the failure of a local lad to destroy James I, a lad who lived just down the road there, the village of Scotton, his name Guy Fawkes. Well, we're now at the heart and hub of the town, at the Market Cross, from where our town crier, Nancy Buckle, makes her cries every market day. The base of the cross is about 1709, and this was set up in the year of the coronation, 1953. But the market itself goes way back to the time of at least King John. It's first mentioned in documents in 1206. But in 1310, Edward II gave a charter to the town, and then he fixed the day as Wednesday, market day, perpetually. And this is the day of wonderful atmosphere of buying and selling and gossiping and life of the community every Wednesday in Knaresborough. Well, this side of the marketplace is comparatively modern, that is to say, mere 18th century. I know for a fact that the building behind me was reopened in 1991 because I was invited to open it as a pub, Blind Jack's Hostelry. And this is so right for Blind Jack because he was a very convivial man, a great drinker and gambler and so on. But 
He started life in 1717, he was born in a cottage to the east of the parish church. But when he was six years old, he was attacked by smallpox. He survived the smallpox, but it left him completely blind. But he lived the life of a normal lad, a very mischievous lad actually, uh, very active, very lively, involved in just about everything that any other lad would do. And he was taught to play the violin. And at the age of 15, he was invited to be the chief musician at Harrogate Spa, which was then developing quite rapidly. And he played his violin at the Queen's Head. But his violin playing has been completely eclipsed by his fame as a road maker. He built a total of something like 180 miles of road throughout Yorkshire, Lancashire, Cheshire, Derbyshire. Not single-handed, of course, but he was a born leader of men and he could organize his gangs of workmen and do all the checking and measuring. He was a remarkable man. And now from Blind Jack of Knaresborough in the 18th century, we're going to walk about a mile along the river, way back into the end of the 12th century. Well, here I am emerging from a riverside cave. There's no doubt that the oldest of Knaresborough's tourist attractions is the dropping well, that marvelous petrifying well, further up the river, and close by it, the cave associated with Mother Shipton. But around 300 years before the time of Mother Shipton, pilgrims used to visit this cave, the riverside hermitage of St. Robert. St. Robert was born Robert Flower in York in 1160. And he came from quite a wealthy family, but decided to live the life of an ascetic holy man. He drank only water. He lived on roots and herbs, grew his own corn. And it's said that he caught and tamed wild stags and harnessed them to his plough. The chronicles of all kinds of tales about him. You know, his, the way he befriended prisoners and outlaws the way he performed miracles of healing, did a bit of prophesying, very independent, eccentric character. And this is perhaps why in 1216, St. Robert was visited by King John, who was staying at Knaresborough Castle and was hunting in the forests of Knaresborough. When he arrived here with his retinue, St. Robert was deep in prayer and would not be disturbed. On your feet, man, they said, the king is here. When he eventually did get to his feet, he looked around and said, King? I see no king. They pointed out who the king was, and St. Robert stooped down and picked up some ears of corn which he had grown himself, and held these out to the king and said, when you can make something as simple and beautiful as that out of nothing, ex nihilo, then I will call you king. His point being that he only acknowledged one king, the Almighty, the King of Creation. And instead of being angry, King John was apparently impressed by St. Robert's piety. And he granted him, and we have the documents to show this, half a carocate, that is 40 acres of land all along the river, on which was later built St. Robert's Priory, the only Trinitarian priory in Yorkshire. Alas, there's nothing of it left now. It was demolished on the orders of Henry VIII. But I like to think that just as Cromwell destroyed the castle and yet left us our famous view, so Henry VIII at least left us St. Robert's Cave and this secluded sanctuary where even the ruthless Plantagenet King John came to pay homage to Knaresborough's famous holy man.